um, here, uh, this, this panel is going to look at um, language revitalization. Where is, where is language and where is language going? And, um, and where is it in terms of um, the different regions? Um, and so with that, I'm going to um, give the mic to my, we were cousins, academically cousins, but this morning she said, I'd like to change that status. You are my brother. So this is, um, I'm handing the mic to my sister, Kazolana. Actually, maybe it's more like he's my son. <laughs> um, the panel members for our Alaska Native Language Revitaliz Revitalization panel are Haley Hana. Haley Hana Stepatin is Unanga from the Kigigun tribe and was born and raised in her homelands waters in the village of Akatan. She weaves together her tra transdisciplinary experience deeply shaped by the Unanga subsistence cosmology she was raised within as an artist and Unanga scholar, dancer, choreographer, performance artist, poet, and activist. Haley Hanna is a PhD candidate in the Native American Studies program at the University of California, Davis, with a designated emphasis in studies in performance and practice. She currently serves as an instructor of Alaska Native Studies at UAA. Tetok Josie Burdon. Tetok retired after 30 years in public education. She spent 28 years at Nome Elementary School and two years in her mother's home village of, of Kingigian or Wales. During the latter part of her career, Tetok taught Inupak language and culture to Nome Elementary's third through sixth grade. She found that profoundly rewarding. Currently, Tito is the primary caretaker of her three-year-old great-nephew, Egagina, Egagina, or Luca, who she says is her pride and joy. I'm very fortunate to have the opportunity to teach him Inupak at his very young age. The dog says she uses her cell phone app to record words, phrases, and sentences with Igagina and sends the recordings to his parents and grandparents with hopes of teaching them the language too. The dog enjoys partnering with colleague Anangalutak or Annie Conger to promote the Inupak language with Inupirakta Kuperluta. Let's speak Inupak while drinking coffee. Or hosting Inupak language public service announcements on one of Nome's local radio stations, KNOM. As Uskulti Loatat, as one of the Uskulti Loatat, Tatok teaches Inupak language classes at Northwest Campus which she finds exciting and valuable. Jo Tatok currently sits on the Elders Committee of Sitnasak Native Corporation, and she is a member of the Community United Methodist Church Inupat Choir in Nome. And I would like to recognize Charlie and Janet Brower who came, who live here in Fairbanks. They're sitting in the audience. They were our pastors at the United Methodist Church in Nome for quite a while. Thank you for coming. Casey Jack, Jakarta. is a young Yupik student and leader from originally from Stebbins. He is a Yupik major with he has he he has a Yupik major with an Alaska Native Studies minor. He is also the adjunct professor for Yupik at UAF. After he graduates, Jakarta 
hopes to work within the field of education, helping to share his language with others who want it. I apologize. I, I have I have to see the words in Yupik written in Yupik and then switch to the Inupak alphabet and then write it so I can say it properly. And I'm just like totally lost with Haley Hannes. <laughs> I apologize. Okay. We have let's see. We have approximately one hour to share responses to six questions. I'll ask the questions and the panel will respond. Kliana, for your work and your messages. So the first question is, what is your role in language revitalization? And what do you see as the future of Alaskan native language languages as facilitators of the language languages? Who would like to go first? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Atka Chakataru, uh, Tapha Mimunga, Unalu Mimunga. My name is Chakatah. I am from Stebbins, Alaska, in the Norton Sound. Uh, traditionally, people in that region were uh, uh, called Unalu uh, people of like uh, Unalu area, Norton Sound. Um, currently, I am an adjunct professor in UPIC, and I teach uh, UPIC 101. Uh, so when students first come in, they start from the very beginning, and I help them uh, learn right from the very beginning. I'm Josie Berdan. I said it was very... I was very happy to arrive here into Fairbanks. Um, I think the <clears throat> my role in revitalization um, in my town of Nome, many of you have visited Nome. Um, it's a vibrant community, about 3,000 people. And so my uh, efforts in revitalizing Inupiaq, um, not only with Northwest Campus and the many programs that they've instituted the last, geez, five years, partnering with heavily with our Native corporations to provide classes from beginning, um, offering many uh, opportunities for community members, not only in our town, but within the region, which stems from Unalakleet all the way to the village of Shishmaraf and all the villages in between there. Um, kudos to Northwest Campus, uh, our local uh, Native corporations really working to foster uh, Native languages and promote everybody to learn, not just Inupiaq, but uh, um, Indigenous people, but anybody in our community. They don't have to be Inupiaq, Siberian Yupik, Central Yupik, anybody can learn. Um, also, I work with uh, Nome Belts High School. I get very um, excited with the high school students just in one semester, uh, which uh, our previous panel alluded to um, students who don't know nothing at a high school age. They are amazing sponges. They learn so quickly when given from an alphabet to, and you all know our words can be so long. And at the end of a semester, just saying, wow, look what you have learned um, in that quarter. Um, also, uh, revitalizing, um, I've helped uh, Bering Straits Native Corporation, um, youth camps, translating for my Native Corporation, um, some of their flyers. Um, in terms of facilitating, um, I think we're all in a role, we, we understand, we, we, we know that many of our first language bearers, our parents, our grandparents, the Utukanat are passing on and the number of uh, people who know the language, know it a little, um, really need our, we're the generation who's going to help bridge that 
and we're the facilitators of that. Um, one thing, and we know the last two years have been really tough with, with the pandemic, but Zoom, Zooming has been a really uh, motivational way to get not only the people in Nome, but we have a lot of Inupiaq ancestors who live in Georgia, who moved to Hawaii and join us to learn um, Inupiaq through Zoom just because they live somewhere else, that they still have that same will that we all want. We still want to keep carrying on our ancestral dialects, our languages. So um, I'm a grassroots kind of a person. I like to do things locally for my town, um, for the region. I really find great pleasure in that. One of the big things besides the speaking um, coffee, uh, at the Kajirvik Center, one vision I have too is many of you like to do puzzles, right? A thousand piece puzzles, two thousand piece puzzles. And I had this idea right before the pandemic if they could go to the XYZ Center with our elders who, you know, they like to meet with the younger people or anybody who wants to speak. Um, something as simple as that, you learn so much from a puzzle. Uva, uh, Sinian, Ittuk. Uh, oh, it's right here. It's not there. Colors, everything, sizes, shapes. What a great way to, to learn the language. But anyway, that's my role as a facilitator. I like to create ideas like that that engage people. Um, Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, my name is Haley Hana Alarum Ayaga Stepatin. I'm Unangach. Uh, I'm Kirirun Unangach. I'm from the Kirirun tribe of Unangach people. And I was born and raised in my village, Akitan, in Unangam Tanangan, or the Aleutian Islands of Alaska. And I live and work on Denaina lands in what is known as Anchorage, Alaska, as an assistant professor of Alaska Native Studies at UAA. And it's there where I get to teach Unangam Tunu, the Nyeroch dialect of Unangam Tunu. Um, and I teach beginner uh, levels of Unangam Tunu as well. And it's really the first time um, that we've taught Unangam Tunu at UAA on a regular basis. Uh, one of my, one of the elders in my community, Iliador Filamanov, who speaks the Unarim or Kawalangam dialect of Unangam Tunu, he did teach a class a long time ago in the 70s, I believe, before UAA was UAA. Um, and it was one semester, so it's not the first, but it's the first regularly offered um, course. And I am a learner of Unangam Tunu. I'm not fluent in Unangam Tunu. It's not my first language. And this is because the language was taken from my dad's generation forcefully. And he was never able to uh, learn it or speak it. He was removed to the schools and even in the BIA uh, high schools after the act where we had to have high schools in the villages to stop removing native peoples. Um, those teachers that came in were still abusive to Unangach people, and my grandparents knew about this, and they didn't want their kids, my dad's generation, to be beaten in school, um, so they stopped teaching it to them. So it's my generation that is bringing back the language um, because there's been a big gap in Unangum to new speaking and teaching. Uh, particularly, especially because Unangam Tanungan is such a big, huge region. It spans like 1,600 miles, and we used to have 13 dialects of Unangam Tunu. My dialect, Kirirun, is no longer spoken. Um, that fell asleep with my grandparents' generation, so I'm a learner of Nirorim Tunu, or the Atkin dialect of Unangam Tunu, because my teacher, my, my elder, my mentor is Dr. Moses Karitach Dirks, and he's been teaching me since I was in about third grade in Unalaska is where I first learned from him. And over the last nine years, um, we really worked on developing this curriculum that I'm now able to teach at UAA with his guidance. Um, and what I'm doing there is teaching Unangach uh, 
not just Dinangak people, anyone who enrolls, but it's um, been really beautiful because there's been so many Unangak people that are reconnecting that I never had an opportunity to meet or to know before because I grew up in my island, in my village. And they were removed. They were, um, their families had not returned after the World War II internment or after the boarding school removals. So they weren't connected to their cultures in ways that I was. Um, so it's been really beautiful to be able to connect with them and share what I know of Unangam Tunu, learn from Mr. Dirks with them too. Um, so I think that's my role in language revitalization is like I'm a connector. I just want to bring more people into the movement. And I want to share everything that I've been taught um, from Mr. Dirks. Take a look back. The next question is, can you briefly give the history of shaming of those who speak indigenous languages and of those who don't? And what is our charge to make sure we don't continue this harm? So again, can you briefly give the history of shaming of those who speak indigenous languages and of those who don't? And what is our charge to make sure we don't continue this Harm. Could start with the dope. I grew up, uh, obviously, Bourdon is not an Inupiaq name. I come from the town of Nome, which is a history of gold mining. So my other family is Bourdon's. Uh, it was a miner. Fortunately, I, um, the Bourdon side, that migrated to Nome for gold, uh, perished and were laid to rest in the Nome Cemetery. And I was uh, raised by a very, very rich Inupiaq family that moved by skin boat from the village of Wales, 1952, to better their lives in Nome. They raised all of us children amongst cousins, very vibrant aunties, uncles, Inupiraq all the time. And we lived a very rich um, traditional life uh, at Fort Davis, which is about three miles outside of town, which was the native place. Our, our family camps to Bilak, Kapshak, make Mizrak. Um, it's where we uh, fish cut, hang fish, make dried fish. It was the food processing place. But with that, I grew up hearing aunties, uncles, uh, speaking Inupiaq all the time, very rich, very full of a traditional native lifestyle. But at the same time, our parents want us to learn very well in school. Don't get in trouble. They don't want the call from the school. They want you to make very good grades. And they also understood you needed to speak English too. But I'm very fortunate in that I have both, I walk both ways. I spoke English, but I come home to a very, very fluent, high, rich, uh, involved family. Ironically though, my mother said, with the five of us children, you are going to make that decision yourself. Either you're going to learn it in a back or you're not. And so we took it, you know, we listened to our parents, okay, and it stuck in our head. And ironically, the three older ones, we call our cousin Ray like a brother, myself, Dwayne, Raymond, we picked it up, but the, the younger half, the other generation, um, really doesn't grasp even the understanding of Inupiaq. My youngest brother, Wilson, before my mother passed away, and he'd come and visit, and she'd Inupiaq, and, and then he'd go, what did she say? So I became the translator. Um, and I think it wasn't not so much me taking on the shame, but I think the, the weight that my parents and my family had to take in terms of 
um, do, do they learn to speak in a back? Now we're in a generation where we, we know we're losing our fluent speakers, but at the same time, I think we're the generation, you all here are a testament that each of our languages so precious to each of our families and our regions um, can only happen with us. I know when I go back home to Nome, you go back to wherever you're from, um, that we can make an impact on what we're doing. I enjoy doing things at the college. I enjoy doing things at singing in the choir when we're needed to. I'm, I enjoy uh, say, hey, can you translate this, our theme for the annual conference? Okay, I'll do it. So I think we're now the, the people who are going to, to help move our languages in a positive way. We can get mired down with, oh, geez. Josie, Dewey, and Ray only know it. Gee, what happened to Mary Wilson and Brian? Um, but I think we have to, to jump those hoops and just, just try to keep preser uh, persevering in our own talents, in our own ways, um, making it better for those who do want to learn. Those who, um, and I'm going to share this real quick. You want to hold this? This is, I'm, and you all should know that I am not the most technological person in, in this room. Barb knows, um, my family knows before my mother passed on and she was at fish camp quite a bit. She had a cell phone before I did. <laughs> so that's my technology, technology knowledge. <laughs> okay, what I do because when she said I babysit Irina, which I do, um, and the parents of my three-year-old grandnephew always ask, Josie, Luca said stuff, and we have no idea what he said. Okay, well, me and my limited technology started doing this. Aka, Aka. Your absence is noticed. So I'll do these and I'll send it to his parents. Mama, I love you. Mama, I love you. And I send it to his grandparents, the, the younger half that doesn't, didn't pick up any back like us older kids did, hoping that they'll hear, um, hear it as well. And, you know, one, one, a quote I learned, and I can't even remember who wrote it, was any kind of of speaking is communication. So even that to me is, is teaching his parents. Can you briefly give the history of shaming of those who speak indigenous languages and of those who don't? And what is our charge to make sure we don't continue this harm? So around the time when uh, the Alaska Native Language Center was established, um, or maybe even a little bit before that, in our villages, we had the BIA schools, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and uh, whenever Whenever them people went to those schools, you know, like um, my parents' generation or my grandparents' generation, they went to those schools. Oftentimes, they might only go up to eighth grade, or if they went to um, beyond eighth grade, they would be sent elsewhere. And uh, the whole time they were in these schools, they were discouraged from speaking their language. And um, whenever he spoke to my, uh, my parents and my parents' siblings, he would say to them, don't speak Eskimo. 
you can't speak Eskimo no more. And um, that's rough because, you know, like that's who we are. And his generation, they felt like our way of life, our living, the very essence of who we are is no more good in this modern day and age. And he didn't want his kids to learn his language or his culture. And so when I came to UAF, I had people in my family saying, you shouldn't do the Yupik language program. What are you gonna do with that? What good is that kind of degree? Do what you were gonna do before. You wanted to do what, engineering? And you're telling me you're gonna do Yupik? What you gonna do with that? I, I, tried, I tried to stick with that program, but I just, you know, it didn't feel like it was what I wanted to do. It didn't feel like it was me. And so against the um, advice of many people in my family, I switched over to, uh, to UPIC and I continued to do it. And a lot of people think that that age of shame is gone, but you know, that shame is carried inside through the generations. You know, I feel it when I speak to my, my uncle, I feel it when I speak to my Anon. I, I, I talk to them, I try to speak to them in UPIC and you know, they just kind of get quiet and some of them, they do speak the language well, but I'll never hear them talk it. They went through something when they went to those boarding schools, those BIA schools, something deep inside them is hurt that they just can't bring that part of them back again. And it's really important for us to never forget this part of our history. And that's why it's important for me to not only learn my language, but to share it with as many people as possible. Yeah, I think shame is a learned behavior. It's not something that we really did as much as we do now. Um, it's something that was done to us, right? Like my grandparents were shamed in the at the in the early 1900s in their schools for speaking Unangam Tunu and for being Unangach and for having brown skin and long hair and for wearing our clothing. Um, and then that continued into the 70s in when my dad was in high school in my village, that shaming of being Unangach, which continued when I was in school in the village um, from our outside non-native teachers. And I think it's really important that we move forward in our language revitalization journey by leaving that shame behind, um, by acknowledging it and um, understanding the weight that it's had on our people and what it's done to our people and our ways of life, our dancing, our singing, our music, our tattooing, our um, spiritual belief systems all have been affected by this shame. I think it's really important to move forward and not continue to perpetuate that shame to new learners. And that means like exactly what you were saying that all speaking is speaking. Um, encouraging those who might not have ever heard Unangam Tunu or whatever language um, when they can't make those sounds or they can't hear the ng or the r and the ra and the k and the ka, right? They can't hear it because they never heard it, perhaps. Perhaps their families were removed and they never got to hear a word in our language. Maybe they've only seen it written and they don't know how to read it. Um, so when I teach, that's a really big part of it for me is uh, stopping that shaming with me. Um, even if I've experienced shame, I was in the military, I experienced so much shame for being a native woman. Um, so, I'm, but I'm not gonna carry that. I'm just gonna set it down and acknowledge it. And I'm not gonna put it onto this next generation of learners or other generations of learners, right? Like I teach all generations of people. Um, but the biggest thing is just making them feel held and embraced that they're taking the step to learn our language, Unangam Tunu, something that my dad didn't get to learn, um, something that a lot of them, their parents, their grandparents didn't get to learn or speak, and not perpetuating that, that you're not speaking or pronouncing things good enough, that um, like not worrying about perfecting all of that right away, but understanding that those things will come when people hear more of the language. Sometimes it takes a really long time for people to make the 
huh, sound in you nangum tinu, as in huh, right? That's like a, not an easy word for a lot of learners to use the nasals and the back of your throat and these other sounds. And I don't ever want to shame them for trying um, because then they'll be afraid to start and they will be afraid to speak. And perhaps they might not ever introduce themselves in Unangam Tinu, which is the basic thing that I'm teaching right now. And I don't want them to feel that kind of shame that they're not speaking it correctly or correct enough. And uh, that goes with fellow language learners and teachers too, like not shaming people because we can't commit our whole lives to living with an elder um, to learn the language fluently in two years. Like not everyone can do that. That's a privilege. Um, so I think just acknowledging the role that shame plays in language work and setting it down and not picking it up and letting it be down there. Wonderful. The next question, what is your message to the many Alaska Native people who are not fluent speakers and or whose first language is English, but want to learn? Yeah, I think everything that I just said is my message to them. Um, I just want them to go into these spaces and to know that they have a right to their languages, right? I'm Unangach. I didn't learn Kirirum Tunu growing up. Um, I didn't hear much of Kirirum Tunu growing up, but I still have a right to learn and speak and use Unangam Tunu. And so do all of our Unangach people. So do all of the Yupik people have a right to learn and use and speak Yuchtun and Chuchtun and Inupiatun and all of our languages. You have a right to it. It's your language. Don't let colonization continue to take things from us. You get to reclaim that language and use it. Since I lost my mother about a year ago, there's uh, a deep desire for me to, to hear native language. So the way I've done that is through YouTube. And it's not even through our Alaska native language in the state of Alaska, the various dialects of Inupiaq, but I've moved on to Kashashlit. And they are just vibrant, their newscasting is all in Katlashlik. And we can understand if you are a speaker of Inupiaq, you can pick up what they're saying. And I found some Canadian um, newscasts as well, all in Inuktitut, um, because I, I have lost my my mother. She Inupiaq, Tuvakami, Atilea Sinik Kamni. When she's woken up to when she goes to bed, she in a era. My brain misses that. So I found now my cousin Rita, uh, she's 82, so she's a fluent speaker. And I call her every day. When you are a person who is raised and hear your native language all the time, every day, aunties, uncles, grandmas, and when those key people are gone, it really does make your brain miss a really, really vital part of you. So I find um, going to YouTube on those Katlaslit um, Canadian channels, um, just because I miss that void. Um, it's something you can't take back when you have a fluent speaker gone and you do anything like learning from another in Inuit language, just to hear it every day again. Before I came to UAF, um, one of the things that I did that really helped me with uh, trying to immerse myself in the language was reading. Uh, whenever I wanted to learn, I read. Um, there were books in school that I was able to pick up some of the Yupik language books. I picked those and I just looked through them. And even though I didn't know how to read or I didn't know what they were saying, I just tried to read it every day. And every day I'd learn a little bit more and I was able to pick up some that way, you know, and these are things that I did because 
in, in high school, I felt like our bilingual programs, you know, weren't uh, up to par. We just learned maybe the days of the week, you know, the numbers and colors, and there wasn't really any um, push to learn any real grammar or language. So a lot of that I had to do on my own. For So for people who really want to learn, you know, just do it. Just just pick it up. You, you have to start somewhere. And the sooner you start, you know, the better and easier it gets. Falling into that rhythm and habit of putting yourself in and immersing yourself in a language is really important. And some people, they fall into this trap of, oh, where do I begin? Where's the resources? That's not the right way to think. If you want to learn, you will learn. And just like, just like me, you know, I, I had a very uphill battle getting to where I am now. And that's what I did. I took the initiative to learn, and that's why I am where I am today. Are you sure you're not older than you seem to be? <laughs> uh, last question. What is your assignment for the next generation of Alaska Native Center faculty and students and your communities? And um, please offer your closing comments. So for ANLC, one thing I really hope that could happen in my um, my assignment to ANLC is to communicate. You know, um, you hear bridge the gap a lot, but what does it mean to bridge the gap? Well, for me, it means getting people talking with each other um, to coordinate our efforts in passing down and revitalizing our language. As an example, you know, for the Yupik language, the Yupik language is split into like three areas governed by three different corporations. You have, you have a few communities in the Bering Straits that are part of the Bering Strait Corporation. You have the Jalista Corporation, then you have like Bristol Bay. And you know, they're all doing their own thing. They're not really communicating with each other. Then you have like the maybe dozen or so school districts and they're all doing their own thing. None of their programs are really you know, what students really need to pick up the language in a way that they should be learning. One of the things that I see ANLC doing is coordinating with the many different corporations and many different school districts talking and saying, how can we help you develop a curriculum that your school districts can use in your schools so that your students can learn? And um, I think that's one of the bigger steps will be taken and something I personally want to see happen during my time at ANLC. From the one who's not so technology savvy, more e-learning, walkie, get us Zooming and get them taped so that those of us at home can pick it up no matter where we are, um, no matter what village we're at. Um, I think that's a really good avenue. The apps are wonderful. When Annie and I forgot, Anangalut and I forgot how to say weasel, we went to the North Slope one and they, oh yeah, terak. And then we go, oh yeah, it's terak, weasel. So technology really helps even somebody like me. Um, the e-learning, uh, Dr. McLean alluded to uh, more partnerships with elders. Um, they are so far and few between. They are just an enormous wealth of knowledge, life, life knowledge. Um, I think it's, well, I just want to say Kakasa Cook for letting me be here and for inviting me. This is my first time really at UAF. Um, and just seeing all the wonderful people here, it looks like um, you all are doing amazing things. Um, it's so cool to be in the presence of so many Alaska Native language speakers and teachers and learners. So just keep that up. But I want to see that everywhere, right? It's hard as a Nunaq person from my island who grew up there, who just wants to be there, <laughs> um, to have access to these sorts of things. Uh, Fairbanks is so far. It's like thousands of miles away from my island, and it would take four flights, one of which is a helicopter to get there. And there's a bunch of connectivity issues where we don't have internet connections and the internet we do have is extremely expensive and unreliable. Um, so I think just 
I would love to see more Alaska Native language centers everywhere. And of course, with this one being the main hub, but branching out and having campuses all over, um, all over Alaska to represent all of the, you know, languages that we do have and to keep being inclusive pedagogically and methodologically. Um, inclusivity is huge. Like I'm we get left out of everything. Um, we're such a small group of people and have so few speakers. There's less than 100 first language speakers of Unangam Tinum and around 3,000 Unangam people in the world. And this is because of the Russian colonial genocide, right? Before then, we had a huge abundant population in 13 dialects of our language, which is indicative of the size of Unangam Tinangin. Um, so just to, you know, we are part of the Circumpolar Arctic language family. My partner is um, actually Inupak, and he's from Piarvik. And I was talking to one of his aunties who speaks Inupetun, and she said, where are you from again? And I said, Akitan. And she's like, well, what is the, what are you? I said, I'm Unangach. She said, Unanga. Unanga in Inupetun means down there. And I said, oh my gosh. Is that where our word for unangach came from that you guys named us? I thought that was so special. <laughs> she said unangach down there. And it's like a term in math too, apparently. Um, so, but since I've been making these connections across our language family of the Arctic, it's been a way to be like, don't forget about us too. Like we're also part of this language family. We have a lot of shared words. My favorite one is terayuk. Inunangam tinu terayuk. 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 Terayuk inunangam tinu is salt as in the ocean salinity. Yeah, it's a, our closest shared word across the circumpolar Arctic. And this to me just shows how we're related through the ocean. Um, but yeah, Karasakok. We would we'd love to to keep being included. I had thought earlier too that each of our villages and each of our towns could have a central building where anybody could go in and learn their, learn their, their heritage language, no matter which town which village that they're in they can just go anytime and maybe it's my lunch and I go listen and put headsets on and hear these old tapes of our old uh who may have passed on um and hear you know just I think that would cost nothing but I think it would help people who are interested no matter what walk of life they come from to be able to go and and read study learn uh, hear, hear their language and, and learn it. That's to me one of the most inexpensive ways, but yet we don't have these in our towns. We have a career heritage center, but there's really no place where you can go put on a headset or back, here's my age, where you put that red, that strip with the magnetic strip and it says, Atosak. And you do it over and over, Atosak. One, you know, I mean, something as, as like that would just a language center for people in every town, any, every village, anybody who wants to go in would hear it at their convenience. Because we all know once we leave here, we're busy people. Thank you. Um, thank you each for sharing yourselves and your passion. I'm very honored to, um, to, to sit here with you. And several suggestions were made. So Walkie, did you get that? Did you get that Walkie? <laughs> Brother, I just, just wanted to thank, um, thank your, um, your presenters here and um, remind you that suggestions were made and we're all here to work together. <laughs> What a great panel. Um, thank you, kids, um, for sharing. Um, and how old are you? Yeah, I wonder that too. I, I hired him to teach Yuchtun um, 101 and um, because of how old his soul is. He's, uh, I'm really, really honored to have him teach my favorite class that I would never have anybody teach. 
you pick 101. That's my baby. Well, he's teaching it this semester and hopefully more, more semesters after this. So uh, with this panel, thank you so much uh, for sharing your vision and your even your stories. The shaming part was something that was really, really critical here and how, yeah, the message I got from this group is um, leave that aside because we have lots of work to do. We have, lot, we have the language to, to, to embrace and to share and to, um, to celebrate. So um, let's um, just get, get, get over that thing and know the fact that it was there and it did, it did, it did exist, but we don't, need to, we don't need to stew around shame. We got too much work to do.